Hello, and welcome to CPH Session 18, Descriptive Statistics and Summarizing and Visualizing Data. This is Part B, a review of the types of data. This lesson will cover material we already talked about in class, but being able to quickly and correctly identify the type of data you are dealing with is critical to both data collection and data analysis. If you are in any way unsure about quantitative tools or how to categorize data types, I encourage you to watch this video. In session 18, part B, I will review the kinds of quantitative measurements we can use and the concept of variables. Then, we will review how to correctly classify those variables into its appropriate data type. So, if you remember, when we collect quantitative data, we can obtain data from several different types of tools. Let's say, for example, we want to estimate the proportion of elementary age children in Kankan City who are overweight. How can we do that? Well, first, we have to define what is overweight. We might choose weight percentile for their age, such as the 90th percentile. Or we might choose BMI. Or we could use waist circumference. Each has its own weakness, but we'll choose waist circumference. Any child with a waist circumference that exceeds a certain number, such as 74 centimeters for boys age 12, will be classified as overweight. Any child with a waist circumference under that number is not overweight. Then we can calculate the proportion. So we need to know the children's waist circumferences. Well, we could answer this question many different ways, using each of the five main quantitative tools. First, we could use direct measurement. So we go to the school and sample children and measure their waist circumference. This method is least likely to have any bias, but it is also the most resource intensive. Secondly, we could use questionnaires. We ask the students their waist circumference on a written questionnaire and they fill it in. This method is most likely to have bias, but it's less resource intensive, which could allow us to have a larger sample size with the same amount of resources. Thirdly, we could use observational surveys. In, the, in this case, an observational survey might take the form of going around and seeing what size pants the children are wearing, or it could take the form of sitting at the school uniform sales shop and recording what size pants children are buying. In either case, we are not directly measuring our variable, waist circumference, but observing, without interfering, some representative variable, in this case, pant size. We believe pant size correlates well with waist circumference. Fourthly, we could use secondary data. If the schools in Kankan have taken waist circumference measurements, we could obtain that database from them. So we have the data, but we did not collect it ourselves, making it secondary data. Finally, we could use structured interviews. Structured interviews are similar to questionnaires in the question format, but allow for some level of follow-up to responses. Waist size probably doesn't require much follow-up, so it's not well suited for structured interviews. But perhaps that question is just one in a broader investigation. So in each possible tool, we generate a variable. Each variable gets one column in our database, with each row representing each participant. The types of statistics we can calculate and the methods we use are fully dependent on what type of data a variable is. Let's talk about the kind of data. If you remember, we can broadly categorize data as either continuous or categorical. Categorical data has a finite number of discrete values that are possible. We have a set list of possible choices, and all responses must be one of these choices. For example, if I ask you your eye color and say that you must choose one of brown, blue, green, or hazel, it is a categorical variable. Or if I ask you your monthly income and say you must choose the, somewhere in the range of 0 to 1,000, 1,000 to 3,000, 3,000 to 10,000, or greater than 10,000 baht, it is a categorical variable. However, categorical data can be either nominal or ordinal. The eye color example is nominal because there is no inherent order to eye color. If we use number values as our codes in the database, we cannot make calculations using those number values. 
On the other hand, the monthly income example is ordinal. There is an inherent order. We can order the choices from highest to lowest or lowest to highest. A special kind of categorical data is binary data. In binary data, we have only two choices that are possible. For example, do you have a dog? Yes or no? Binary is special because we can code responses as one or zero, which allows us to use them in certain statistical models. So, for example, we can perform linear regression on certain variables among dog owners and non-dog owners. So, remember, categorical can be ordinal, nominal, or binary. Now, let's look at continuous data. For continuous data, variables can be interval or ratio. Almost always, continuous data is a continuous ratio. That is, zero means zero. If I earn zero dollars, it means I don't earn anything. A weight of zero kilograms means no weight. A classic example used to demonstrate the other kind of continuous variable, continuous interval, is temperature using the Fahrenheit or Celsius scale. In those cases, zero does not mean zero heat or zero energy. The zero point is arbitrary. However, if we use the Kelvin temperature scale, zero would mean zero heat, and in that case, it would be a continuous ratio. So let's go back to the circumference example. If I directly measure children's waists, I will have a continuous variable. And because zero means zero in that case, it is a continuous ratio. If I ask the, on the questionnaire, what is your pant size? And I give options like sizes one and two, size three, four, sizes five to six, etc. I have a categorical variable. And because there is, there is an implied order, it is categorical ordinal. And then if I classify my participants as either overweight or not overweight, that variable is binary. So that's it. At this point, you should be able to identify a variable and categorize its data into the correct data type. That's it for part B. In part C, we'll learn how to calculate statistics for continuous data.